you never know when something catastrophic or traumatizing might happen in your life. Man, it's so common to think like that. So many people aren't communicated a different way to think. You got to learn how to lose before you learn how to win because you're going to learn, you're going to lose a hell of a lot more than you're going to win. Welcome back to Off the Cuff. My name is Daniel Priori, and I am joined by professional surfer. Yes, professional surfer. Uh, my friend from Australia, he is a mental health advocate as well. He travels and does seminars and speaks anywhere uh, about mental health. He's I, I'm reading your thing uh, earlier today, and I have to immediately get right into surfing. Cooper, of what age did you start surfing? Man, thanks for having me. It's it's an honor to be 100%. on your show and let you get to know my story a bit better yeah. from over the ditch in Australia. But yeah, I mean, I've been surfing my whole life, really. I'm 28 now. I started surfing when I was about seven, so close, a bit over 20 years now. So I've spent a lot of time in the ocean. I, I grew up around the beach here in Australia and just by Sydney. Um, yeah, and my family was really into the beach. My dad surfs. My dad still surfs every day now. He's in his 60s, so shows how important surfing is to me and my family so yeah i was oh. just down the beach from the age of like seven eight getting pushed into waves by my dad and then straight away kind of showed a bit of talent and yeah we had kind of been competing in events we have like little junior events from like the age of 10 and 11 so yeah yeah it's been a, a huge portion of my life i've spent competing and surfing and traveling around the world doing what i love which i'm very grateful for i tried surfing a few times it's fun but like one time that happened to me was I got thrown off the board and the, the like the undertow, I guess, just dragged yeah. me down to the bottom of the ocean. I was just sitting on the bottom of the ocean for like 10 seconds. And I was and I just looked up and saw the sun like kind of coming through the ocean. I was like, dude, I need to get the fuck out of here. And I would have felt like a lot more than 10 seconds. Too. Oh, it felt like I was down there for I was like, this is it. Like, I, um, I decided to come out here. I'm just and now I'm just going to die in this wetsuit. Like, this is what's going to happen. There's too many elements. That's the scary thing. It's the element. Well, that's the most exciting thing I think about surfing and what draws me so much to the ocean is the unpredictability and then the idea of trying to predict the unpredictable. And that's where like good surfing comes from. The mm. best surfers are the ones who can read the ocean the best. And obviously it's very hard to read something that's changing, but that kind of what is what makes it most exciting. Every single wave you stand up on is going to be different. So you never get that repetitious practice. It's all right. about adjusting and adapting and being reacting really quickly so that's why i think i really love surfing listen you're winning national titles at a very young age right is there a, a sort of pressure that comes after that like uh did you ever have any brushes with like you know being nervous or anxiety like while you were beginning to surf or was that something that kind of happened a little later in life i mean throughout my and this this you, line me up very well with this question because this will explain why I got into mental health quite well. Yeah. So throughout my junior career from, I'd say 14 to 20, I was quite successful. I was kind of this big fish, small pond in the Australia region. I was kind of in the right, top, right. let's call it two or three juniors from the age of like 10 in my age division up until I was 20. So for me, when it came to like, there was ups and downs for sure. Like I took losses quite hard. I remember as a kid crying almost every time I lost until I was probably right. about 16 or 17. That's just the love of, of winning though. It fucks with you when you're a kid. Losing sucks yeah. when you're a kid. You oh, kind of have to learn how now. to lose. Yeah, it sucks oh, now. Absolutely. But like you get, you learn that's, how to lose. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's what my dad said to me a lot when I was a kid. Like you got to learn how to lose before you learn how to win because you're going to learn, you're going to lose a hell of a lot more than you're going to win, especially in a sport like mine in an individual sport. Yeah. There's one win. There's, there's 95 losers every event and one winner. Like I haven't won an event in years to be right. honest. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you gotta, you, you gotta learn how to lose. But when it came to my mental health and this idea of anxiety and stuff, there was like little bits throughout my junior career, but I was on a, a, this trajectory. And I tell this story in my mental health workshops that for me, when I was a junior, I, I used to base my self-worth and my overall well-being on my achievements and my successes in my surf comp. So if you're looking at it like a bit of a wavelength and roller coaster, I was hitting these peaks of good well-being quite often. And then I progressed from the junior tour to the international tour when I was about 20, 21 and well, actually like 19, 20. And I went from this big fish, small pond to small fish, big pond. And I went, I not slid down the rankings, but I went to the international qualifying tour and went from top couple in Australia to sort of rank between 50 and 100 in the world, which looking back, 
is something to be quite proud of. But oh, when you're in gym, insane. There's so many oh, people in the world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and but, but when you're a top junior and you kind of go onto that next tour with high hopes and you slide down to there, my mental health was quite affected. And because I was basing my self-worth and my personal value on how I achieved that sort of wavelength of like hitting this high well-being got a lot more infrequent. Yeah. So I kind of started, I started to struggle a little bit with my identity. I felt a bit of shame, like being around people at my local community when I wasn't succeeding as often. And then I went and spoke to my sports psychologist about how I was feeling and what was going on. And he's like, man, it's so common to think like that. So many people aren't communicated a different way to think than to base their self-worth and their overall well-being on their achievements and their successes. For sure. And he challenged me. And he said, I want you to think like this. I want you to take this forward in your life and it's going to change the way you think. And he said to me this, he said, I want you to base your life on how well you live to your values. And that mm. was this light bulb moment that completely changed my life. And that sent yeah. me on this quest of, of being curious as to ways to one, discover my values and really hone in on that. And I went on this sort of journey of reading a lot of self-development books, listening to a lot of incredible authors and um, podcasts and just being very curious as to ways to improve my performance For sure. as an athlete through the mental side. And yeah, since then, it's just completely changed my outlook on the world, completely changed my outlook on who I am as a person and where I can go in life and how happy I can be worth on that. And yeah, yeah I think a lot of listeners will probably re resonate a lot with that. The thing I, I, I respect about you too, is that, you know, on this show, you know, it's, you don't have to be sufferer to help the suffering. Mm. You know, I think, I think a lot of people have a hard time understanding that in the mental health space where it's like, well, I'm only going to listen to this guy because he almost killed himself. Or I'm only going to listen to this guy because he tried to kill himself and it didn't work. Or I'm only going to listen to this guy because he was in jail for 45 years. You know, it's, there's things that, that especially that the mental health community, you know, cause uh, I'm diagnosed bipolar uh, type two. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's almost nice to see it's like, it uh, like an ally connection for people that are like, Hey, like, I don't necessarily have mental illness, but I want to help people that might end up suffering from mental illness or uh haven't been diagnosed yet i think it's i think it's very important to have outside you know influence you know because every well, like you said everybody's timeline's different everybody's story is different everybody deals with things differently the whole thing is like we are all on a spectrum of mental health to mental illness from right. this spectrum and we're all moving up and down it from time to time. For sure. And what I'm trying to do is I like to think of it like life is almost like a treadmill that's dragging us from mental, good mental health to mental illness. And we're all walking against it just at different paces. And I'm trying to give people the skills to be able to walk against it at a faster pace so that when life does speed up and throw some of these really difficult times at us, you can walk back against it. And that's what so many people are ill-equipped for these difficult times that happen to us all. Like you never know when something catastrophic or traumatizing might happen in your life. Yeah. And you want to be so prepared it's important. for it. Exactly. And that's what I'm trying to do. Upskill. It's about mental health maintenance and build daily habits so that for when sure. we do, we do slip, we can come back to them. Right. I share with participants this idea that it's quite hard to create a new habit and you tell someone practice gratitude every day and they go, Oh, I'll do it for a day or two. And they forget. So right. what I say now is, when you brush your teeth every day, every single person brushes their teeth at night, hopefully. Yeah, right. <laughs> Think back to your day. What went well during your day today? And it's a good opportunity to build a habit around something that is already a habit. So when you brush your teeth, while you're brushing, go, all right, what went well today? Oh, I had a conversation with James at work. That was nice. Oh, I ate a piece of food that was good today that I really enjoyed. I had my favorite food for lunch. That was nice. Oh, I did a workout today. Felt good. That was nice when we reflect back through our day and take a moment and build it on top of another habit, that's a really good one that I try and encourage people to do. So that's like part of the workshop. Trick your brain a little bit into like getting a new, getting a new habit. I like that. Exactly. It's like, it's called habit stacking. I learned it from a book called James habit clear um, by, by, by James clear, incredible author, but this idea, or maybe it's called atomic habits. Sorry. It's not called habit stacking. That's like the theory in it. Yeah. 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 A a atomic habits by James clear, but yeah, just, we all know how hard it is to form a habit, but we already Especially brush our ones. teeth. So if it's just a, 
Yeah, if it, yeah, exactly. Especially good ones. Bad habits are easy to form. But yeah, so if you stack on top of, oh, I'm brushing my teeth. I remember that guy on that podcast I listened to said, when I brush my teeth, think back to what you're grateful for from that day. And instead of being, I'm grateful, you can choose blanket gratitudes, but it's important to make them really daily and moment, like choosing moments in your day that were good because then it turns it into a mindset. I think, you know, especially with the work that you do, it's something that is almost the stigma of mental health is that it's always so fucking dark. Yeah. You know, it's just darkness and like this. And, you know, I think if it's portrayed a certain way, especially with the younger generation, because a lot of the stuff that they take in is like depressing shit, you know, like Mm. music's kind of depressing. Movies can be depressing. TV shows are depressing. You know, it's like, Mm. you know, they kind of fits into all of this, this shell of like, it's almost niche to like, be sad you know how yeah. how it's how it's shown you know how we consume information now yeah so it's you know i think w- what you're doing is uh kind of showing that there is a there is a light uh in all of us really that we could that we can turn on and this is what these small habits that you're talking about things that we're learning about uh constantly either with from reading or conversations with friends making this a normal conversation to have with your family you know, like mm. even for you, like you, you talked about how you sat down at dinner and like, it was like, oh, like, yeah, like somebody else killed themselves today. And it was almost mm. like as if it were normal. So, yeah. it, so that, that's, that's tough. And, and for you to actually make a stand and be like, no, like you guys, like you guys understand what's going on here. There's like some crazy shit going on here. Yeah. I think it's just developing an understanding and being open-minded to so many people get told something and they're like, no. Nah. It's like, you got to learn to just like, I'll listen to anything. Even if I know they're wrong, I'll kind of try and work out why they're thinking like that. And like, I just think having like a curious mind is so important with every part of life. And that's led me to where I am today and just sort of having a go at things. Just like starting stuff. So many people aren't like, uh, yeah, waiting for the right moment. Like for instance, and realizing that things grow. Like for instance, I have these things on Instagram called the 1% Good Club, which is part of the Good Human Factory where every morning I send a 10 minute guided meditation and every night I start a gratitude little train of messages and it's an accountability group. So it's a little reminder. Oh, here's a meditation to try today. Oh, here's yeah. that person's three gratitudes. I'll write mine today. And it started, I did it for myself because I needed accountability to look after my own and do these two little daily habits. So it's called the 1% club because 10 minute meditation, four minutes of gratitude, 14 minutes is 1% of your day. Mm. So it's 1% if you meant 1% of your day for your mental health. So anyway, I started and put out on Instagram saying, I want to join these groups. I want to keep myself accountable, get involved with me. I'll give you a meditation every morning to try and we'll write our gratitudes every night. It started with like 40 people the first day, kind of through my Instagram signed up. And now it's at like 900 people every single day. Each week I count the gratitudes and like last week. So if anyone wants to check it out, it's I'll send you the link to the Good Human Factory Instagram. But all you got to do is just send at the good human factory a direct message saying i want to join the club and you'll get added into a group there's like 30 people in each group because instagram group chats max out at 32 yeah yeah but it's really cool what what it's done is created these little sub communities because every day it's the same 30 people you've seen right their gratitude so you begin to know their life but they're complete strangers to you right right see and and people support each other it's it's been a fascinating little experiment but it's just grown into this thing now where yeah every week there's like thousands thousands of gratitudes getting written in and you just feel like such good vibration from it that's good i love that i love that see like you're you're an earth dude (laughs) like uh i could tell like some people are just more grounded and connected and like cohesive with just like the earthly surroundings that's that's something that that i i I hope i could be a little bit more sometimes i get lost in the sauce Nah, i appreciate that i get jealous when i see like ah this dude's grounded it's jealousy for two seconds and then then it's inspiring. 